Ephesians chapter 4. Are you there? Okay, I'm beginning to read out of verse 17. I'm reading out of the New King James Version this morning. If you have a different version, you can just follow along. We're also going to put it up on the screens. I'm beginning to read out of verse 17. I'm going to read a couple verses. I want you to follow along with me. It says this. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their what? In the futility of their what? Mind. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your in the spirit of your what mind Paul let's talk about the mind here and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness out of those few verses I want to speak a message this morning that it's been on my heart it's been on my my mind and uh, if you're taking notes you can write this down at the top I've titled it life to the fullest life to the fullest and uh, we're going to be talking about these few verses this morning and uh, I just want to share a little bit of what's on my heart as we've been going through this series again if this is your first or second time in church just love to welcome you to the house of God we are glad that you're in this place this is the family that welcomes you here every single Sunday you are welcome in this place we are glad to have you in the house and uh, I believe that you, I know you could be anywhere, but I believe that you'd be the best decision to be here this morning in God's house with God's people in the best service, the 9 a.m. service, by the way. And uh, you made the right choice to get up early, bright and early. And uh, maybe somebody lied to you and told you they were going to get you breakfast and they brought you here. Uh, it's okay. They're going to get you breakfast afterwards. But we're just glad that you're here. We're just a community of believers who don't have it all together, but we follow the one who does. And uh, we are not perfect by any means. We are far from perfect, but we follow the perfect one. And we got our eyes on him. And as a community, as a church, we've been going through the book of Ephesians. We've been going through this brand new series trying to grow up a little bit. We want, we want to be mature in Jesus. We want to be mature in Christ. We don't just want to come in and out and let this be a routine. We don't just want to come in and out and sing some songs. And uh, I think that's okay, but if everything stays external and nothing happens internally, then we're not really connecting to what God wants to do in our lives. And as a church, as a community, we've determined over the past five weeks, we want to be more like Jesus. And uh, we want to be committed to growth and maturity. And uh, we want to look like him, talk like him, act like him. And today we're going to talk about that. So we're glad that you are here. It's, it's going to be quick. Uh, I'll be done in about uh, 60, 75 minutes. And then we'll worship for another two hours. And then we'll go have some breakfast. I'm just kidding. I've got 20 minutes left. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we just thank you this morning. We thank you, God, for this house. We thank you for the community of people that you've gathered in this house. God, we pray that your spirit may have presidents and God, may you just control this service. God, move us out of the way. We pray that, God, we would decrease and that you may increase. God, we want to hear from you. We want to see you. We want to know you, God. God, more than just another church service, we want a God encounter. We pray that you have your way in this place, God, that nothing that I say would get in the way, God, but that you would even speak through me this morning, God. God, I pray for every single person in this place. I pray that you lift up heads. I pray that you heal hearts. I pray that even as we just talk about your word, you begin to do the healing. I pray that even as we talk about your word, you begin to awaken hearts and open up eyes, God. We thank you that there is freedom in the house of God. We thank you that there is love, mercy, hope, and peace. And God, we thank you because we believe that today, that same powerful anointing that resurrected Jesus, it's going to be over the Miami Heat as we win game seven and go on to the conference finals. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, Amen. come on, all God's people say, Come on, 9 a.m., can you give Jesus one big shout of praise one more time? Come on. Thank you, Sam. So uh, it is, we are in 2016. By the way, how, how fast does time fly? Time flies. We are in 2016. I still remember, I was remembering the other day when uh, the clock was about to strike midnight in the year 2000. Anybody remember that? It was, it was Y2K. 
and uh, the world was going to end, and Jesus was going to come back. And I remember being about, um, I, I forgot how old I was, uh, 15, 14, I don't know, and uh, saying, okay, Jesus, I'm waiting for you to split the sky open, and uh, this is how we're going into year 2000 in heaven. And anyways, we're in 2016. As the years go by, every year we have a goal, right? All of us. We have personal goals, personal things, and I think one of the ones that has been on the top of my list over the last several years has been to get in shape and to get lean. Anybody in here have similar goals? Come on. This is... This is the human struggle, right? Like, like say no to carbs, um, why carbs are from heaven and uh, they're from God. And this has been one of the things, like, it's been consistent on my, it's like every year I want to get better. I was doing CrossFit for a little bit, then I found out that was from the devil, so I stopped. But I remember my cro- the CrossFit coach where I was at said every year since he turned 30, he decided to take out something from his diet. He started with sugar, then he started with something else, and he just kept cutting things every year, and uh, he's better than me. Uh, but I-, I realized, okay, I need to do things like that, so I started cutting sugar. By the way, me and Pastor JP, in the month of December, we decided to cut sugar. Both of us lost almost 10 pounds just in the, m- in the month of December. I mean, it's crazy. And uh, I hope that helps you today. God bless you. That was a major key I gave you today. And uh, that's about it. Let's pray and worship. I'm just kidding. But it helped us so much. So, so we've been trying to get lead. So I, this is a consistent thing I've been trying to do. So, so for, I'll give you an example. Last week, I, I was doing so good. There's days where I said, okay, I, there are low-carb days, and some days you got to throw in some carbs just to uh, trick your body. I don't know that's what they say. All, anyways, I was having a low-carb day. I was having a day where I was on it. I said, okay, I've been exercising. This week has been great, low carbs. And uh, at about 5 p.m. in the afternoon, uh, Pastor Heda comes, uh, my dear friend, personal, best friend, comes close to me. And he says, hey, um, do, do you want to go to the Colombian bakery down the street? <laughs> I'm not Colombian, but God bless Colombia. Um, they have the best breakfast, uh, pastries. Okay, we got a Colombian click back there. Awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, do you want to go to the Colombian bakery with me? And uh, for a moment, for a moment, the devil tempted me. And uh, I looked at him in the eyes and I said, get behind me, Satan. And... Uh, <laughs> I was doing so good. I was doing, <laughs> I was doing amazing. And uh, so I felt like I overcame that hurdle. He's like, okay, you know what? Yeah, you're right. We're, we're, we're all trying to eat healthy, trying to eat clean. And about five minutes later, five to ten minutes later, his wife comes into the office, and she just drops off a red velvet cake on the desk <laughs> and walks out. Me and him are staring at this cake. We are looking at this cake like, oh, my goodness. This now, now, now. You have to understand, red velvet cake is to me. <laughs> red velvet cake to me, it is my biggest temptation. Like, like, like that is my struggle. Don't judge me. You got your struggle. I won't judge you. Pray for me. But this is my biggest temptation. Red velvet. By the way, if you like red velvet, go to Cheesecake Factory. They have a red velvet cheesecake. <laughs> Cheesecake Factory did not make it. It is God himself who made it and gave it to mankind. (laughs) She just dropped it off on the desk and walked out. Now, I I caught myself afterwards. I didn't even think about it. I like swallowed that cake. (laughs) I made a really bad choice. And uh, Pastor Hannah looks at me like, you just told me no to the Colombian bakery. 10 minutes ago, but you devoured this cake. And I, I, I have to admit, I'm going to be honest and transparent, I made a really, really bad choice that day in eating the red velvet. And I started thinking, you know what? Choices are important. Choices, what we do in life, the choices we make are extremely important. More than a diet, more than the life we want to live, the choices we make in life are extremely important because they will shape our life. Uh, There's some things that some of us are facing in here today that are direct consequences of choices that we made yesterday. And there's some of us that are going to face some things tomorrow because of some of the choices we made today. Choices are going to shape us. Choices are important. We have to be careful of the choices we make. Choices. what What are we going to do? How are we going to act? How are we going to talk? How are we going to live this life? How are we going to behave? We have to watch our choices. Choices are important. And this is what the Bible tells us. In fact, we said a couple weeks ago in the beginning of this series that the gospel is all about two things. It is about change and choice. Why? Because God comes into our life and God changes us. He's changed us. He's brought us from death to life. We have been changed by God. 
I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that God has changed me. I'm grateful that God has brought me back to life. I'm grateful that I'm alive. I'm grateful that I found mercy, love, hope, forgiveness. I'm grateful that God came and opened up my eyes and showed me everything that I have in Jesus. But now, because of that change, I have to watch my choices. Because if my choices continue the same as they were before the change, then have I really changed? If we continue to make the same choices, if we continue to act the same, behave the same, talk the same, then I wonder if there's really any change. There probably isn't. We don't, we don't make better choices because we want to change. No, we make better choices because we have been changed. And this is the way we're supposed to live life. And ultimately, some days, we will make bad choices. If we're honest, if we can be really transparent Sunday morning in church, I know we're supposed to put on Sunday's best and put on a smile and everything's okay and we got it all together. But if we can be really honest as a community of believers, sometimes we're going to make some really bad choices. Like eat a red velvet cake <laughs> on a low-carb day. Sometimes we're going to make some really bad choices. The Apostle Paul here in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17, he is coming into the picture and he's telling us, hey, hey, watch your choices. God? Watch your choices. <laughs> That's an alert right there. Watch your choices. Watch what you do. Paul is coming into the picture and he's saying, hey, watch the decisions that you are going to make. And here he's going to begin to talk about our choices now. Remember, we said that the book of Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3 are all about doctrine, are all about theology. Paul was talking about our relationship with God and everything that God has done in Jesus now to our lives, how he's blessed us, how he's predestined us, adopted us, chosen us, how now we are part of his family. We are sons and daughters. We now have an inheritance. We have been inherited into the family. We have all those blessings of God. He talks about everything that we have in Jesus, 1, 2, and 3. It is all very vertical, and now he's about to go horizontal. Now he's saying, okay, because of all the change that God has done, it has to affect your choices. It has to affect the way you live. We, we talked about this two weeks ago. Uh, last week was Gary Clark, but the week before, we started chapter four, and we talked about unity. If you were here, we talked about unity, and that is the first choice, is that if God has really come into your life, that there's really been a change, it has to affect the way you live with one another. How do you treat your neighbor? How do you look at your neighbor? Are you, are you the one that's uh, constantly bickering and fighting and, and try to get into wars here at church? And I don't like this brother. I don't like this sister. And did you see what she wore? Did you see what he wore? Oh, my goodness. I don't like that cologne. I don't like the perfume. I don't like his breath. I don't like all these things. And all we do is try to bring division. Paul is saying that there hasn't been change. And the way you live with one another. Now, in 417, he's going to continue to talk about our choices. And this is what he says. Remember, this is a community that is living in a crazy, busy city. And it is a city that is full of false gods. It is a city that is completely upside down. Now, this is a thriving church. And he's trying to remind them, hey, watch your choices. And he says, hey, I want you to do one thing. He says, I want you to watch how you walk. He says, walk not like Gentiles. Verse 17 says, walk not like Gentiles. Now, the word walk, literally every time that the apostle Paul says walk, literally what it means is live. Anytime you see walk, you can replace it with live. He says, live not like Gentiles. Who are Gentiles? Gentiles are those that are away from God. They are not in a covenant relationship with God. He's saying you are in a relationship with God. There's been a change in you. You have professed Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have come into a relationship with Jesus. He says, so don't live like those that don't have a relationship with Jesus. There has to be a difference between the followers of Jesus and those who don't have a relationship with Jesus. There has to be a distinct difference. We cannot look the same. We cannot act the same. We cannot talk the same. We cannot behave the same. There has to be a difference between those who are holy. Holy, we've messed up that word so many times. People look at it like, oh my God, what does holy mean? Holy just means separated. We have been separated by God once we become followers of God. And he says there has to be a difference. You can't keep walking like Gentiles. You can't keep walking like Gentiles. Don't walk like the Gentiles. Don't live like the Gentiles, the ones who don't have a relationship with God. How do they walk? And there he begins to list how they walk. He says, first of all, they walk in the futility of their mind. Oh, wait, what, what does this mean, Paul? Paul, what are you trying to say here? He's saying that their minds cannot operate to the full function that God intended for. Their minds are disconnected from God. The Gentiles, 
The people who are not in a full relationship, covenant relationship with God, they cannot understand everything that God designed them for because they don't know God. The human brain is a powerful thing. The mind is a powerful thing. And here Paul is saying that away from God is basically worthless. Oh, because human, humankind, uh, human beings, we can make great achievements. We can come up with great inventions. You see society today. We have the Apple iPhone. That's a great achievement. The Android, that's not a good achievement. But we have different things. Humankind has made so many great advances in human history. Technology and science today, it is rushing and running by the day. But at the same time, how corrupt is the world that we live in today? Pornography is filling every single website you can think of. It is running rampart all over the globe. Human trafficking is a real evil that exists in our world today. I mean, just think about the cases of rape and molestation and abuse, physical and mental abuse. Racism still exists in our day today. It is very much alive. This is the human mind that is separated from God. It cannot think about what God wants. It cannot think about what God intended for them. It does not know that God designed them for a purpose because it is disconnected. It is futile in its own mind. All it wants is its own selfish pleasure. All it wants is its own selfish advances. All it wants is its own selfish goals away from God. Solomon said, everything is vanity. It's a chasing after the wind. Humankind away from God, all we want to do is make our own choices and fulfill our own lust and our own desires. But away from God, nothing will ever fulfill us. And this is what Paul is trying to put the picture. He said, hey, don't walk like the Gentiles. Don't walk the way they do. Remember, they have futility in their mind. Everything they think of, they can come up with great things, but nothing ever seems to satisfy them. What good is it that you have all the material things in the world, but it does not satisfy the soul? What good is it that a man gains the world but loses his own soul? Paul is saying they walk in the futility of their mind. Their understanding is darkened. In other words, they don't have the light of Christ in their understanding. They can't understand the things of God. That's why you, you, if you go up to a person that does not have a relationship with God and you start talking about godly things or spiritual things, they cannot understand it. Because their understanding has not been enlightened by God. Our understanding has, there it hasn't. So they don't understand the things of God. And it says they are alienated from God. In other words, they are away from God. They are not close to God. Now, this is true not only of them, this is true of us before God. It's very easy to point fingers and say, well, these people, they don't got it all together. The truth is, none of us had it all together if it wasn't for God's grace. And he's saying, don't, don't walk like this anymore. This is how you used to walk. This is how you used to live your life. It, 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 Paul begins to be very negative, but what he's about to do is go from a negative to a positive. But he wants us to understand how bad our condition was before God. It wasn't just that we were in sin, it's that we were completely disconnected from God. It just, it just wasn't that we decided to sin, it's that we were completely darkened in our understanding. It wasn't that we wanted to come to God and maybe hope for no, it's that we were completely alienated from God. He's saying, this is the life that you lived in. I don't want you to continue to walk in this way. Hey, pay attention, watch out, watch out with your choices. Don't begin to live this way because there's been a change in you. Now the choices have to be different. Basically what Paul is saying is that it begins in your mind. He's saying, wait, 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 this is not what you learned from Christ. That's what he begins to say in verse 20. He says, this is not what you learned from Christ. He says, wait a minute. And, and then in verse 20, he actually begins to say, I assume you have learned from Christ. In other words, well, I mean, you say you're a Christian. You say you're a follower of Jesus. Well, I hope you are. Because if you have, then there has to be evident change in your choices. All right? That's why we see people who say, oh, I'm a Christian. But then when we begin to see their fruits, it's like, are you really a Christian? Oh, I'm a believer. Are you really a believer? Because some of the choices you're making seem like there hasn't been no change in your life. He says, if you have really heard from Jesus, then there really should be a change in your choices. Oh, because Paul knows this by firsthand experience because Paul was a persecutor of the church. 
Paul was one who used to kill Christians and stone Christians, and he hated Christians. In fact, he was present when they first murdered one of the first Christians, Stephen, who was the first martyr of the church. Paul was there, and he opposed the church. He opposed Jesus. He didn't like the church. He was after the church. He wanted to be done away with on the church. And on the way to Damascus, it says that a light shone so bright that it knocked him off his horse, and he heard from Jesus. And from that day on, his course, his direction, everything changed and his choices were now different he's saying if you had the encounter that I had with Jesus oh there has to be evident change in your choices this is what Paul is trying to say he's saying if you have heard from him oh then then you know this is not the way of life and here begins to say put off the old self put off be done away with put off the old self Be renewed in your mind and put on the new self. This is what Paul now begins to explain to the church in Ephesus. Put off the old self, be renewed in your mind, and put on the new self. If you notice this section, this passage in Ephesus is kind of interesting because he begins with the futility of the mind, and now he's ending talking about the power of the mind. He says you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What does that talk about? Is it just the brain? No, it's talking about the seat, the control center, the emotions, the will, the feelings, the thought patterns of our life. Everything that has to do with humanity, it is in what the, what the Bible calls the mind or the heart of man. And he's saying you need to be renewed in your mind. This is where God wants to do a work in your life. You need to be renewed. That's why the Bible says in the book of Romans is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need to be renewed in your mind. Why? Because your mind can go places. Why? Because our our minds can make bad choices on certain days. One day our mind can look at a piece of red velvet cake and say, "I, I want that today. In the world that we are living in today, with the things that are grabbing our attention, with the things that are calling for our attention, it is very easy for our mind to wander off and go the way it used to go. It is very easy all of a sudden to change our course and go back and make some of the same choices that we used to do before there was real change. It's a struggle. It's not easy. If we could be honest here today, if we could be transparent and let our guard down, Say, hey, you know what, there are some days when I make some bad choices. Breaking news, I don't have it all together. Breaking news, I'm not perfect. Why why do I make these bad decisions? Why do I I burst out in anger and, and say certain words that I shouldn't say in? Why do I treat my wife a certain way? And why, why do I treat my husband a certain way? And why do I treat my kids a certain way? And how come some days I just wake up and I just, I just make some bad decisions and I shouldn't do those things and I, I shouldn't go to that website and I shouldn't see those things and I shouldn't make those decisions and I, I shouldn't cheat on my taxes and I, I shouldn't lie to my boss. And why do we make bad choices? Why? We all do. It's the human condition. It is the flesh that we're in. It is the sinful world that we're in. And guess what? Every day is going to get harder. And the world that we're living in every day is going to get harder. And Paul knew this, and he's telling the church in Ephesus, hey, why? Don't go that way. Remember, there's a futility of the mind. Darkened in their understanding, alienated from God. Don't, don't make those choices. That's the way you used to live, but you've been changed. Now you've got to make better choices, but, but it's so hard. How does it begin, Paul? It begins by the renewing of the spirit of your mind. What does that mean? It means that some days we are going to want to make that bad choice. Why does it look attractive to us? Why do bad choices look attractive to us, right? Like if we could be honest, why? You know, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 26, verse 11, it says, as a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. In other words, what we we exited from our system, what we didn't like, all of a sudden there are days where we are going back to that thing. 
Why? Because it looks attractive? Because it has all these things to offer? No. It is our sinful condition that we are in. And if we're truthful and honest here this morning, we could say, hey, there are mornings and there are days and there are nights where vomit looks appealing. There are days where I make some bad decisions and I go back to my old ways. There are some days when I don't make good choices. There are some days when the good choice is a little difficult to make. And I go after the bad choice. And we're going back to, to vomit. I know it's gross. I know it's disgusting, but it's true. How many times do we go back to the same sin? How many times do we keep making the bad decisions over and over again? How do we do this? Begin to renew your mind. The battle is in your mind. It begins in our mind. When bad thoughts come, when bad decisions come, replace them with good decisions. Say, so you know what, I, I want to make that bad choice. God, 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 you know I do, God, but, but I'm going to fix my eyes on something else. I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. My soul, my flesh, it, it wants to go after this disgusting thing. I don't know why it wants to continue in wrong, but I'm going to make a choice to turn the other way and realize the change that there's been in my life, and now it has to affect my choices. And I'm going to look to Jesus consistently and constantly look to Jesus. It is a renew. By the way, that word renew, literally what Paul is saying there, it means a daily habit, a daily thing where we renew our minds. That means every morning we got to fix and focus our gaze on him. Because the world will all of a sudden shake our focus. There's going to be some mornings where we wake up and Jesus is not the focus of our lives. Maybe some people are more spiritual than others. Praise God. Bless your soul. But if some of us are honest, there's some mornings where Jesus is not what we're thinking about. There are some mornings where we are looking at our vomit. And we have to renew the spirit of our mind. That's why they say that the first 15 minutes of the day are the most important ones. What do you do? Some of us, we go to Instagram before we even talk to God. We go to our emails. We go to the text messages we've received. We're already thinking about what we're doing at night at 7 o'clock in the morning. Renew the spirit of your mind. Fix your attention on him. I'm not talking about a change in behavior. I'm not talking about a change on the external. That's not what Paul is talking about. In fact, the only reason there's a change on the external is because first there has to be a change on the internal. If we're talking about external things, that's religion. Religion says you have to change in order to get God. Relationship says, relationship says because you got God, now there's been a change on the outside. Now because I have God, I'm not doing it to be better because God wants to make me good and God wants to make me better. God didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Because of that, okay, I got I to gotta realign my focus. I got to look to Jesus. It's funny, Paul puts this in chapter 4, the same chapter where he's been talking about unity in community, in church. You know why? Because it's a lot easier to realign and look at Jesus when you're in community. He's saying, hey, remember, you are a team. You are a church family. You are together. Don't let there be division. And hey, don't do what other people do. Don't walk like those that don't know God. Re realign your focus. Start renewing the spirit of your mind. You know why? It's a lot easier when you sit down and you do it with somebody. I talk about Pastor Hedda and him offering Colombian pastries, but I thank God for his life. He's a brother that can hold me accountable. And I can go up to him and we can talk about the Bible for hours and we can talk about our relationship with God and, hey, can you hold me accountable on this? And, hey, every day I need you to hold me accountable about this thing. And I want you to check me and I want you to talk to me and I want you to ask me questions. I appreciate the pastors that we have on staff here because 
we can easily go and sit down in an office and say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. Help me to renew the spirit of my mind. This morning, maybe you're in here and you're saying, Alex, I, I've made some bad choices. There's times where I've gone back to that red velvet cake. There's times where I've gone back to that, that thing that I once expelled and exited out of my life. There are some days, some mornings, some nights where I go back to it. But today you're saying, I want to renew my mind. Away from God, there is no way that we can live life to the fullest. Society, this is their goal. This is their focus, right? Hey, I'm going to make the most out of life. I'm going to get all the money I can. I'm going to get every, every material possession I can get. I'm going to get the house. I'm going to get the, the dog, the car, the wife, the kids, the job, the dream job. I'm going to get everything. But Paul says you cannot live life to the fullest because your mind is futile, darkened, alienated from God. And you give yourself over to your senses, to your sensuality, to the greed, and to the things in your life. A life alienated from God begins to worship self. He's saying now that you are with God, now you can make better choices. And now what does it look like? How does this look like now? Apostle Paul says, these are some things that should be evident. Look, and we'll finish up with this. Chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. Look what the Apostle Paul says. After, after you've been renewed in your mind, after you've taken off the old self and put on the new self, the new self is in Christ. What happens? Verse 25 says, therefore, putting away lying. That's one thing we could put away. No more lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. This is the choices we're going to make. Are we going to continue to lie? Or now because there's been change, you know what? I belong to a community. I belong to a family. I can't live life alone. i got to speak honest. Put away lying. Be angry and do not sin, verse 26. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Before you used to get enraged and get mad at the whole world. Now he says, hey, there's been a change in your life. After you put off that old self, after you renew your mind, don't get angry and let the sun go down in your anger. Verse 28, let him who steal, who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to those who have need. Those who used to steal, steal no longer. You've renewed your mind. There's been a change in you. Now you've got to make a better choice. Verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. We've talked about this over the last several weeks. How are we speaking? What are we saying? What words are coming out of our mouth? If there's been a change, and we got to make better choices. Alex, I can't control it. We could control it. Got to be careful. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's life to the fullest. You want the better life? You want, you want to really have life? Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come to give life and life more abundantly. Paul says, I want you to live life to the fullest. Don't, don't keep walking in the ways that were away from God. All eyes closed and head bowed all over this auditorium this morning. I pray that God would speak to us this morning. I pray that the Spirit of God would open up our understanding and our eyes to see Him and to realize everything that He's done in Jesus. We've been changed. Something happened in us where we came from death to life. Something happened in our spirit, in our soul. He awakened us and he showed us this brand new life that he has for us. 
And he's saying, you were away from me. You were alienated from me. You were so far away. You were darkened in your understanding. You were, the futility was of your mind. I mean, you couldn't even, your brain and sin came and it made a shortcut connection. And all of a sudden, it, the sin just messed up our mind. But in Jesus, everything has been made right. And our choices are affected. What are we going to do? How are we going to live? It first begins with a real relationship with God. All over this auditorium today, while eyes are closed and heads are bowed, I believe that there's some people in this room that you still don't have a relationship with God. But I believe you came into the perfect setting because today God wants to have a relationship with you. And I believe he brought you in here with a plan and with a purpose to remind you that he loves you, to remind you that he has a hope and a future for you. The Bible says he, his intentions are not for evil. They're not to harm you. They're to give you a hope and a future. All over this auditorium, as the church is praying, if you're in here, you're saying, Alex, I don't know God. I've made bad choices. I'm far from God. There's sin in my life. And I feel like God wants nothing to do with me. He wants everything to do with you. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to save you. He wants to start a brand new relationship with you. The Bible says that you and I are sinners and sin separates us from God, but that's why Jesus came down to this earth. God in the flesh, he came. He took your sins, my sins. He went up on a cross and he paid the price for sin. He died on that cross and went into the grave for three days. And after three days, Jesus resurrected from the dead. He's alive today. He's offering brand new life. He's offering forgiveness. His arms are open wide. Today you can begin a relationship with God. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow's promise for no man. As the church is praying in a moment of privacy, eyes closed, head bowed, all over this auditorium. If you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, if today you're saying, Alex, I want a relationship with God. At the count of three, I want you to raise your hand right where you're at. I'm going to acknowledge you. Then you can put it right back down. All over this place. One, two, three. If you want a relationship with God, you put your hand up high, as high as you can. Amazing, amazing, amazing. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amazing. God bless you. Awesome. Put your hand up as high as you can. You want to make a decision to follow Jesus. God, I thank you for these hands that have been raised. I thank you for these people who've made a decision today to follow you. And God, they want to enter into a relationship with you. I pray that you come and you seal them with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. All of you who raise your hand, in fact, the whole church, let's repeat this out loud. Say, Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity. I admit that I'm a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you died for my sins, and on the third day, you resurrected. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. From today on, I'll follow you all the days of my life. I am saved. I am forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, church, can we put our hands together? Come on, let's get up on our feet. Thank you, Abba.